everyone is on their unique path. All of us have a unique path we're going along with a past and a present and hopefully a nice long future. We're all living out a life story that no one will ever have again um, or has ever had previously. And that life story, that past, present and future, those associations that enable you to see the world as no one else can see it, and as you're having that experience, to change the associations that are constantly updated, this constant interaction, this wonderful dialogue between your brain and the outside world as you are living your life is gradually and slowly making your brain completely different, embedding itself in the connections that you have. So you see why your brain is special. And in answer to the first question, why are you different from everyone else? You can see why. It's your brain cell connections that has given you a unique take on the world, a unique trajectory that no one else will ever have. Now, if that's the case, we can say that the biological basis of the mind is not some airy, fairy, philosophical alternative, if you like, to the squalor of the chemistry of the brain. It is the personalization of that brain, as we've seen, through the unique dynamic configurations of your neuronal connections, in turn driven by your unique experiences. So that's why you are so special. Now, if that's the case, and we're talking about the young brain here, the big issue is what will happen if the environment changes, if, as I hope I've persuaded you, the brain is exquisitely sensitive, as the human brain is, to the human environment, if the environment is changing in unprecedented ways, might we not be changing also in unprecedented ways? Now, I've had a lot of flack in the press from this because um, I've been called scaremongering and so on, but among neuroscience circles, it is a given because we know how adaptable the brain is that the brain will change. The big question is, is it for better, for worse? on what's going to happen, not whether it will change or not, because that's what brains do. They will adapt to any environment they're in. And you can see here one reason why I'm saying that the brain is so different of the 21st century. Just look at this, 900 hours between a child's 10th and 11th birthdays that are spent in class, 1,300 hours with their family just under, and get that, just under 2,000 hours in front of a screen. So let's think about what that could mean and how the screen might be changing. Well, just to show that I'm not a complete middle-aged baby boomer Luddite, let me recommend this book by Stephen Johnson, which is beautifully written and very persuasively argued. All the good things its name suggests about screen technologies and what they can do to how you process information, for example. And one very convincing parallel he draws is between playing computer games and IQ scores. And he points to the fact that IQ scores have written in, risen in many countries over the last few decades and says, could this be because when you're playing a computer game, it's very similar to the same, same kind of skills that you're rehearsing when you do an IQ test. You have fixed sequences and patterns that you have to be alert to. You have to see trends within a fixed period of time. You have to come up with a very specific answer. And those kind of information processing skills and pattern recognition are very similar to the kind of things you might be doing in a computer game. But then he says, and I think we need to think about this, just because IQ scores are written doesn't mean to say that the number of novels being written has risen or insight into the economic situation or politics has got any better than it has been. So there's more to the human brain and human mental activities and cognitive talents. There's more to it than simply IQ tests. That's not to denigrate IQ tests or information processing, but let's be honest, information is not knowledge. So when you're, playing an, an IQ, IQ, when you're doing an IQ test or when you're playing a computer game, you're processing information very quickly, you're making appropriate responses, you are, in a sense, becoming a computer. What you're not doing is necessarily understanding the significance of the things that are being there. It's a bit more like when you're driving, the immediate thing is to respond quickly and well and appropriately. So your attention is fragmented by all these different things. You have to focus on what's relevant, decide what's relevant, and act on it. That's not the same necessarily as, in, as understanding. Information and knowledge are not necessarily the same. So this is what he says, and I think it's very persuasive. Another issue about doing lots of things at once, for some reason people think it's good that you can do lots of things at once. And here you are, would you like this in your house? Would you like a lavatory like this? Tastefully furnished, at least it's all colour coded, colour matching in green. Um, but if you looked at some experiments with multitasking, it's not all good. Here you can see the human brain where the subjects were listening, and I'm sure you're familiar with these kind of scans where the active areas are shown there in red and yellow. With seeing, again, different areas are lighting up. But when you ask someone to do both those things, perhaps most parents here will know, there is less listening when you multitask. Because the brain can only process certain amounts of information in a certain unit time. And if you are doing lots of different things, you can't do one thing, as it were, in depth. 
So that's one concern. Another area that makes me worried is this. I'm sure you'll recognize um, the name methylphenidate. If you don't, I'm sure you'll know of Ritalin. Um, this is the generic name, methylphenidate, for drugs given for attention deficit disorder. And in the UK, in the last 10 years, this has trebled. Now, either doctors could be prescribing more liberally, or the condition of attention deficit disorder could be being recognized more as a condition, or, and this is not mutually exclusive, could it just be, might it just be, that if you put a young brain, a young child in front of a screen that mandates a short attention span, that that is what they will adapt to because human brains adapt to whatever you ask them to do. So if you think about it, could it be that um, if you have a movie like this, So say as a three or four year old, you get used to living at that pace, and then you go to school, and you're asked to sit still for half an hour, might you just fidget a bit? Yeah? And this is what concerns me, is that we need to look into how, especially for very young children, a fast paced environment, such as usually a screen will offer, because it's competing with the real world. So to compete with the real world, it's only got vision and hearing to offer. It has to be super noisy, super fast, super extreme, in order to get your attention. But once it's got your attention, will that span be very short because you're demanding ever more exciting things? So again, a screen has to, on the whole, be strongly sensory um, in order, because what you see is what you get to compete. And we know that small children are like that anyway. I have a, a brother much younger than me, and I remember when he was little, he was 13 years younger, if his ice cream fell out of his pushchair or something and he burst into tears, you, all you have to say is, look at the birdie, look at the bird, and suddenly everything is fine. Whereas if you say that to a depressed adult, look at the birdie, they're not going to thank you for that. It doesn't really work because they have a cognitive take on the world, whereas a child is sensory, they just live from moment to moment. How sweet, how fast, ice cream gone, bird up, you know. So they live in this world that has a very short attention span that is driven by novelty, by strong sensation, by the next thing that comes along. Now, if you do that, if you live like that, then you don't really think in terms of abstract concepts very much. So again, using my benighted brother as an example, when I was 16 and he was three, I used to torture him routinely. And um, one of the many tortures, I forced him to learn Shakespeare. I thought it was quite funny having a three-year-old learning Macbeth. And then someone said, must have gone a storm in playgroup to have this three-year-old saying, tomorrow, 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 creeps in this petty pace from day to day. You know? um, but there's a line in that, and this is my point, um, that you may know, a very famous line, out, out, brief candle, life is but a poor player. Now, if you'd said to him at three, Graham, do you understand that? What does that mean? out, out, brief candle. He would have said probably something like, well, I have a birthday cake and I had a candle and the candle, if I blow it, goes out. What he wouldn't have said, well, actually, it's a metaphor for death because he was only three. How could he possibly understand? Whereas you need to have the established associations and connections to really understand that line. Out, out, brief candle means death. It means the transition of death. And what I worry about is if people live in a purely sensory world, a visual world, that kind of notion is going to be very hard to... How would you show that on a screen? It would be very hard, simply just for fun. I took a word like honour. Honour is a very complex and subtle word with many cultural implications and nuances and so on. If you Google on Google images, this is what you get. Yeah? Now, if you showed that to a Martian, do you think they would understand what honour was? I'd suggest they wouldn't. So what we need is to think about how we can still have these abstract concepts. And as I've said, we need to distinguish between processing information, which is valid and important thing for us to do, heavens, but we shouldn't confuse that with understanding or significance. For example, if you play a computer game to rescue the princess, I don't know if anyone plays PlayStation, here we are, in a world of darkness and magic, power-hungry warlords battle one another for chaos, the noble princess Yukihime is kidnapped. Now let me ask you, do you care about Princess Yukihime? Do you care? But you don't care about it at all. Whereas, if you read Tolstoy's War and Peace, I bet you care about the princess. Otherwise, you would not read the book. The whole point of reading a book is to, because the characters there have associations, they have significance, they have meaning because of their past and their future and their relationships, which you're enjoying and involved in secondhand, admittedly, but they have a significance to you that makes them interesting and important in a way that just a name or just an icon will not. It's the associations that make it meaningful. Now, if that's the case, if you're living in this instant world of strong senses, what about empathy? 
Now, we all know that there's this thing called happy slapping, which is truly monstrous, where you show on YouTube people being physically or mentally bullied or hurt. What kind of people do this? Could it be not so much they're sadists, but simply they don't understand, they are no longer empathizing with what it feels like to be hurt? It's a very interesting notion. Look at these two little kids here. They're not talking to each other. They may be playing with each other, but really they're communicating with the computer. And we know that when you communicate in three dimensions, these things are very important. Eye contact, for example, that's this is how you start to empathize with people. How much you look somewhere in the eye, how long you hold it for before you look away, all that is determined by how much you know someone, the nature of your relationship, and so on. If you just stare someone in the eye like this, they freak out. And if you talk to someone and you don't look in the eye at all, they're completely spooked. So we learn in a very subconscious way as we're growing how to hold eye contact, when to look away so people don't feel uncomfortable and so on. You then have body language and, uh, and voice. And together with eye contact, you can see this counts for a huge amount of the impact that you have on someone. Um, and then there's pheromones, the sneaky chemicals that somehow predispose you to liking people or not. And then, of course, physical contact. My dad died in uh, February. And I know, as I'm sure many of you do, the power of a hug when you're feeling very upset compared to a thousand words, someone comes up and gives you a hug. But it has to be the right person, it has to be the right point of your body they're touching in the right way. So it's a, you know, it's a kind of very, very powerful, but very skilled and sophisticated thing to do is how and when you touch someone. So eye contact and body language and voice tone, above all physical contact, is hugely important for empathizing with people and for establishing contact, and yet, None of these things are available on Facebook. In Facebook, you have words, which are 10% of total impact. So if you have small kids who, again, have 900 friends that they have to deal with every day, hi, how are you, I'm fine, how are you, or whatever, and you, know, you don't learn how to hug someone, when to look them in the eye, when to look away, what kind of things are going to happen in the future? And I worry about the rise in autism, and that's a, a, a spectrum of disorders, I'm sure you're aware, where the person has a problem empathizing with others and seeing them not, they see them as kind of cartoon characters, they don't see them as people who have separate feelings and the like. And we know that on Second Life, as shown here, um, autistic people are very comfortable. Second Life, I'll remind you, is if you get bored with your first life and you want to be Vlad the Dragon Slayer or something, you can go and do that. Um, but it's a world of movement where actions speak louder than words, where you don't have to empathize or understand what other people are thinking or feeling in the way that you do when you read a book or indeed when you talk to someone. So I'm worried about reduced empathy. Fitting in with that is identity. How do you see yourself? How do you see yourself fitting in with other people? If you don't have a past or a future because you're in the moment, saying yuck and wow and yuck and wow, um, how do you see yourself and your enduring narrative that normally is characterized, as I've seen, your unique lifestyle? Well, I couldn't resist showing you this in terms of identity, someone losing their identity. 1999, this is a history of blogging. I just have to tell someone about this thing my cat did today. 2004, oh my God, cat pictures on Flickr. 2005, YouTube, moving cat pictures, and then that pinnacle of civilization, Twitter, 2007. 1 p.m., my cat just sneezed. 1.02, cat sneezed again. 1.04, cat hasn't sneezed recently, getting worried. Huh? Uh, and it does make you wonder why people do this. Why? I, you can see for the Arab Spring, it's obviously the technology is powerful and wonderful. I'm not present on technology, it's more how it's used. Why would people spend a lot of time thinking other people were interested in this kind of flood of consciousness? Yeah? Doesn't it remind you slightly, just slightly, of a small child? Look at me, I'm putting on one sock. Look at me, I'm putting on another sock. Look at me, because if you don't look at me, perhaps I don't exist, because I need, perhaps these people who Twitter a lot are in some kind of...